And, and they lived happily ever after. These are words that many of us have grown accustomed to hearing in many of the stories that we read. We've grown accustomed to hearing that line at the end of bedtime stories, we love and live for a good ending. We all like good endings because a happy ending helps with us being able to endure long stories. We read books, go to the ending. I'm sorry, we read books to get to the ending. We watch movies to see how they will end. I thought about this because while I'm not much of a movie buff, I'll admit that I can sit through a slow start and even a bad start to a movie if it's going to pick up at the end. We can't even begin to count how many children's books ends with this line and they lived happily ever after. The Bible is full of happy endings. We're familiar with the happy ending of Joseph. The Bible tells us that Joseph's brothers hated on him, sold him into slavery. He was accused falsely of sexual assault, placed in a prison. But at the end, he was reconciled to his brothers and he was able to save his entire family. And they lived happily ever after. When I think of happy endings, I think of the widow woman who was starving to death because the prophet Elijah said that there would be no rain until I say so. And the prophet Elijah tells her, here's what I want you to do. The Lord sent me to you, and I need you to bake me a cake. She says to him, well, I only got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And my plan was to make sure that me and my boy ate and we were going to die. And the Bible says, the man of God said, I heard you, but take care of me first. And out of faith, that's what she did. And the Bible says, and now one day in her life, after that moment, did she ever have to wonder if she was going to eat. And she lived happily ever after. Daniel comes to mind. Daniel was praying. He was a righteous and upright man, and he prayed to God. And uh, you know the story. He was thrown in, the, in, in a lion's den. He's thrown in a lion's den simply because he was righteous and upright and God had given him favor and he had some haters who couldn't stand him. But because he was such an upright man, they had to create a problem when there was no problem. And as a consequence, because he was faithful to what it was that the Lord had invited him to do, called him to do, he's thrown in a lion's den. And I always like that line. I think somebody preached, I think it may have been Kiko not too long ago. She mentioned Daniel being in the lion's den. And there's a line where the king comes to the lion's den and asked if Daniel was okay. And the next line says, and Daniel answered. That's the shout for me. <laughs> Daddy answered. And Daniel that story, we stopped there. He lived happily ever after. But in the book of Job, we are introduced to a gentleman who was a great man of God and had everything that he wanted. And often, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the story of Job, we start at chapter 1, we may go into chapter 2, but we don't really engage the rest of the chapters. Do you know the book of Job is 42 chapters long? We often stop at chapter 1, maybe chapter 2. We get the context and we talk about how evil and nasty and horrible Job, uh, Job's life was. But even Job's story has a happily ever after. 
I want you to look at this line found in Job chapter 42, verse number 10. Look at what it says. It says, and the Lord, after rather, Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. From this one line and the balance of this chapter, I want to preach using as a subject, when God turns things around. When God turns things around. Would you look at somebody near you? Muster up a little Holy Ghost. Look at them like they owe you money. And tell them, I need God. Look at them. Tell them, I need God. I need God to turn some stuff around for me. I need the Lord. Like I really do need the Lord to turn some stuff around for me. My brothers and sisters, God is a God who specializes in divine turnaround. The God that we serve is a God who specializes in turning things around. I know we hear that often in our neo-Pentecostal culture, and we've heard it so much that it's lost its luster. But I need you to hear me when I tell you the God that we serve is a God of turnaround. And I don't just say this merely to evoke an emotional response, but I say it as an expression of the fact that it's true. God has the power to turn negative into positive. He has the power to turn bad into good and good into better. He has the power to take every negative situation in your life and everything rather that was turned upside down and turn it right side up. Maybe you're here this weekend and you've got a fav unfavorable report from a doctor. And while you're grateful for the prayers that have been prayed for Miss Trudy, you want somebody to pray for you too. Maybe I'm preaching to a couple here who's on the verge of divorce. Maybe I'm preaching to somebody here and you just can't get past your past and you feel like a failure, like you've let yourself down and others. The good news is the God that we serve is able to turn things around. And maybe I'm saying that too fast because I thought you would get it by now. I'm not saying that you have the power. I'm saying the God that we serve. This is the God who reached out into nothing. Put his hand on nothing and pulled everything out of the nothing that was made available to him. This was the God who told an elderly couple who was getting ready for retirement that they were about to bring a baby from an old, dead, barren room. This is the God who brought freedom to the Israelites by making a highway in the middle of a sea, sending water from a rock and manna from a sky. This is a God who gives victory by making the sun stand still and walls to fall with one shout. This is the God who can bring light out of darkness and life out of of every dead situation that is in your life and while I don't claim to be a prophet I do hear the Lord saying I'm getting ready to turn some things around in your life I'm getting ready to lose some things that's been holding you down because I'm God and I'm the God who can make the impossible possible and the unseen seen and I'm glad we got that out the way because I want to switch gears while the fact that God is a God who specializes in turnaround is amazing reasons for us to shout this weekend, I really wouldn't be doing this, te this text justice if we stopped there and shouted all day. And the reason why is because when I read the story of Job, I kept feeling like something about this story is missing. And the more I read, Pastor Clark, the more I became convinced that within the narrative logic of the book of Job, there are more than 42 chapters and then those 42 chapters are more than just a happy ending. That is to say that as we experience our moments and seasons of divine turnaround, there is more to the turnaround than just the turnaround. I only highlight this as a point of preachment because for many of us, when we hear that God's about to turn it around, we automatically, and dare I say, erroneously assume that the turnaround is all about us. You see, we tend to believe that God's only going to show up and show out in our lives because he wants to show up and show out in our lives. But 
the truth of the matter is that thing that God is turning around in our lives is an invitation for God sure to show up and show out. But I want to suggest that our turnaround is an invitation for God to not just show up and show out, but to show up so that he can show us something about who he is and about something that he is able to do. So he doesn't just show up to turn our lives around because he's just trying to show up and show out. But he's showing up in our lives because he wants to show up to show us something else about who he is that will help us to ultimately understand and appreciate everything that we've gone through. And so here's the question. Why does God turn things around? What is it that we learn about God as God is turning things around? I want to submit only a couple of things. Here's the first one. I want to submit, first of all, that God turns things around for us, Pastor Clark, to give us new clarity about his character. That is to say that when God turns our suffering into something that we can shout about, he also gives us the potential to discover new things about who he is. I didn't read this, but when you read verse number 5 of chapter number 42, we understand we, we understand this. Job says in verse 5, Job says, before I went through what I went through, my ears, verse 5, had only heard about you. But now that I'm on the other side of what I've gone through, my eyes have now seen you. Okay, let me give it to you again. Before... The blessing that I experienced before, it was only based on what I heard about you. But now that I've gone through the difficulty that I've gone through, I've now, I've now moved from hearing about you to being able to see you. I came to tell somebody that when God turns things around, he does it because he wants you and I to understand his character better. Friends, it's in our struggle, it's in our difficulty, it's in that season and in that situation that needs to be turned around where we are trying to, where, I'm sorry, where we discover rather in fresh a new sense of how God works. This is what Job learned. The text tells us that as a result of the turnaround, Job gains a new sense of clarity on how God works through his word process. Everybody say process. He, he discovers that while it's true that God has the power to turn things around instantaneously, every now and then God slows down a process because there's something that we've got to learn in the intermediate. Now, I know when we start talking about process, this is where some of us get tuned out because in our culture of microwave cooking and instant access to everything, we don't like things that take time. We want God to do what we need him to do, and we want God to do it like yesterday. Job teaches us here that restoration is a process. Listen to what I just said. Restoration is a process. That there is no quick prayer or religious activity that you're going to do in order to see restoration tomorrow. It's a process. Don't know why I feel led to say this, but this is why it's okay to have theology and a therapist. Because restoration is a process. It's a process of discovery and development. Job gets the clarity about who God is and how God works through the process. So interestingly enough, we are introduced to Job. We learn his story in the first couple of chapters. We're at chapter 42, but there's a whole lot between chapter 2 and chapter 42. And everything in there was about process. Friend, the reason that God allows us to go through process is because for many of us, we treat God. We tend to treat God like he's some cosmic Santa Claus whose only responsibility is to give us what I want when I want it. And we assume that God's only responsibility for bringing about the good in the world is about what I can get. And when he doesn't do what I think God ought to do, then what I end up doing is holding back my devotion because I don't understand why you can't do what I need you to do. But as I read the text, I got to be honest, there was one thing about the process that I couldn't quite wrap my head around. Because one of the things that frustrated me when I read through the book of Job is this. Nowhere in any of the 42 chapters does God ever explain to Job the real reason 
why he's going through what he's going through. That, that, that mess with me. Now, we know as readers, we're told at the very beginning of the book why Job is going through what he's going through. You know the story. The sons of God were together. And Satan shows up. The Bible says Satan shows up looking for somebody to jack up. And listen to what God says. God says, have you thought about my boy Job? Here's a question that ain't even on this paper, but I just feel the Holy Ghost asking me to ask you. Can God trust you with trouble? Are we living in such a way, friends, where God can recommend us to go through hell? The Bible says that that's the reason why God, I mean, why Job rather goes through what he's going through. It's because God recommended him. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So, so, so we're told the reason, but nowhere in the scriptures does God ever tell Job. Because God never tells Job for 42 chapters, Job and his friends, and of course us by extension, we are left to try to figure out why a good God would let something bad happen to somebody who has been nothing but good to God. Because it wasn't like Job was a bad guy. In fact, the Bible introduces him as the most righteous and upright guy in the region. God never explains to Job why Job went through what he went through. And to make matters worse, when Job, when Job actually asked him directly, God still didn't answer why. Maybe I'm by myself out here, but I, I got to admit, there, this really frustrates me because it almost appears that God misses the point of the whole conversation with Job. In fact, it seems like, at least on the surface, God ain't even trying to deal with the real issue. And yet, in spite of not having the answers to the questions, Job was still able to say after the storm, verse 5, that before the storm, I only heard about you. But after the storm, I see you. Church, the whole time I studied this, the only question I kept coming up with is, where did Job's clarity come from? How could Job, without getting any answers from God, be able to make sense out of the suffering that he was going through. And then Job said to me, V, the reason I was able to make sense out of the nonsense that was happening to me was because I finally grew to the point that I recognized that I really don't need answers when I got access to the answer. That's what prayer is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me well. You and I, in certain seasons of our lives, God ain't trying to answer certain questions for us because he's trying to remind us that he is the answer. And so God didn't explain to Job why he suffered because that's not the main lesson that Job needed to learn. Instead, Job needed to learn a bigger lesson. And, and, and it's this. God had used this season to teach Job what he really needed to learn. And that's this. No matter what we experience in our seasons of suffering, God is still in control. And the closer Job got to the answer, the clearer he began to understand why he went through what he went through. Let me see if I can make this live for you. There, there's an old story about a Persian rug maker who was known for making these beautiful rugs. And the way he would make these rugs was he would hang them on racks. As the rug was being made, he would stand on top side of the rug and he had assistants who were working for him who worked on the underside of the rug. These assistants only had one job. Their only job was to put the thread in the exact place where the rug maker instructed them. Now what's interesting is that they, when they looked at the rug from their side, the rug didn't look beautiful. In fact, there were times when they questioned why the rug maker would take this yellow thread and place it here next to this purple thread. They were trying to figure out why the master would tell them to put the thread where he was instructing them because from their side it didn't make sense to put the thread where he was telling them to put the thread. But that was because their knowledge 
was limited. They couldn't see what the master saw. You see, from his side of the rug, he saw the whole picture. And as he saw the whole picture, he was seeing it in a way that he, envi- he, he was seeing it rather the way that he envisioned it from the very beginning. And so when he told them to place the thread in a particular spot, that was because from the master's view, he could see what the workers couldn't see. And even when he tried to explain it to them, they still probably wouldn't understand because they were on the underside. Their job, friend, was to follow and to trust the master and to trust that the master knew what the master was doing so so that the end product would be exactly the way the master envisioned it. And when the rug was complete, it was only then that they were able to move from their side of the rug to the same side as the master and see the beauty of what has been made. Friends, I guess what I'm trying to say is when we look at our situation from an earthly viewpoint with our limited understanding, with our limited perspective, and with our limited knowledge, we sometimes struggle to see the see how things are going to happen in our lives and how they're going to work out for our good. But that's on only because we on the underside of the situation but friends we serve a God who sees the whole picture from his infinite wisdom and he has a vision already about how things are going to play out and if the truth be told even if he tried to explain it to us we still wouldn't understand until the complete product was finished so God says since you can't see what I see what you need to do is just follow my instructions and do what I told you to do the way I told you to do it and stop looking for the next instructions when you ain't done what I've told you to do because the worst thing you can do is doubt my wisdom and dispute my will instead here's what I need you to do trust that I know what I'm doing come here William Cooper God moves in mysterious ways his one to perform he plants his footsteps on the sea and he rides on every storm so judge not the Lord by our feeble sense but trust him for his grace because behind a frowning providence God hides a smiling face his purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour and though the mud though the bud rather may have a bitter taste sweet will be the flower just keep doing what the Lord is telling you to do even when you don't understand why he telling you to do it because friends God turns things around because he wants to clarify give us rather a, a clear sense of his character but here's the last thing he wants to demonstrate his commitment of care to us hear me friends when God turns things around you and I will see the lengths to which God is willing to go to care for you and I. Verse, verse 10, put it back on the screen. It says, after Job prayed. After Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Go down to verse 12 for me one, one time. I want you to see verse 12. The Lord blessed, here's here's where we really like to shout. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the farmer. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. Go to verse 13. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. Go to verse 14. We finna have fun with this one. The first daughter was named Jemima. The second, Kezia. And the third, we're going to call her Karen. (laughs) We're going to call her Karen. Karen. Verse 15. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughter. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years. After the suffering, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Verse 17, here's the last verse. And so Job died, an old man, full of years. 
After Job prays, the Bible says God restored Job's fortune. That term restored in the text carries with it the idea of something being put back into place. It's the picture of having a broken bone being reset. And after you know how it is, after you've broken a bone, it's stronger there. It's the picture of God setting, uh, God uh, God setting, uh, taking those things rather that were captive into the lives of the children of Israel and allowing them to experience freedom after being captive. This is exactly what Job discovered in the text. The chapter closes with God putting on a demonstration of God's power, God's provision, and God's providence to restore jo Job's friendships, his fortune, his family, and even his future. And he does so because he wants us to Remember that no matter what we're experiencing, friends, if you remain righteous to God in the midst of your suffering, God will bring about restoration to you. Listen to what I just said. God says when you remain righteous in the midst of your suffering, I am going to restore you. In other words, when you and I show God that we are willing to serve him for nothing. God's going to make sure that he provides everything that we need because the God we serve takes delight. He takes pleasure in, sh in showing favor to those who have been proven faithful to him. David put it this way in Psalm 37. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. God turned things around for Job because he needed everybody around him to know that even in suffering, I know how to take care of my own. And I came to remind somebody, encourage somebody not to worry about anything or about anybody that you've lost in a season of suffering because God has the capacity to restore you to everything that you've lost. It doesn't matter what you've lost. It doesn't matter how long it's been gone. God will give back to you what has been taken Away. Come here, Joel. God commands the, prop, the prophet Joel to tell the children of Judah that God will restore the years to you. The years that the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm have eaten. And you will eat plentiful and be satisfied. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrous with you. And so when God restores, hear me, he doesn't just give us what we've lost. But he always gives us more and better than what we've lost. J Jesus reminds us of this as I push toward the close in Mark chapter 10. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. It says, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has ever left home or brother or sister or mother or father or children or feels for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. Oh, yeah, along with persecution. <laughs> because God is in the process of giving us more. The Bible says that when it was all said and done, that the Lord blessed the finish of Job's life more than the first. That he blessed the end of Job's life better than the beginning. At the beginning, Job, friends, was a multimillionaire with houses and cattle and donkeys and land. And at the end of the life, God gave him just as much, if no, twice as much. Money, sheep, oxen, cattle, donkey. He started out with 7,000 sheep in chapter 1. Chapter 42, God gives him 14,000. He started out with 3,000 camels in chapter 1. Chapter 42, God gave him 6,000. Started out with 500 pair of oxen and donkeys in chapter 1. And now he's got 1,000 pairs of oxen and donkeys because God is in the business of giving us when we're faithful to him, double for our trouble. But God not only restored the finances of Job, God restored Job's family. For the Bible says in chapter 1 that he lost all 10 of his children. And look at what God does. In his old age, God gave him 10 children. Now here's what's interesting about how he handles the 10. Because for those of you who are students of scripture, you know, that in the usual practice of scripture, if a, father, if a father mentioned any names, he would only mention his son's names. But the sons were the ones who would, of course, be the keepers of the inheritance. But notice that the text doesn't mention anything about the sons. But it does say something about the daughters. Because when God turns things around for you, he's not just going to give you enough 
for yourself. He's going to give you something for all of your children. The Bible says that when the spirit falls on us, our sons and our daughters will prophesy. I'm almost done, but let me push toward the close by looking at these names. The first name of the, the name, the first name that, that we are introduced to, the first daughter's name was Jemima, which means day. Because God had turned Joseph's season of darkness into the light of day. And I want to encourage somebody who perhaps is walking in darkness and you've gotten very comfortable in your season of darkness. Know that the light is about to break. Kezia, which is translated fragrance. Job calls her fragrance because he wanted to thank God for replacing the stench of loss with the fragrance of victory. And that final daughter's name is Karen. Whose name means cosmetic. Because every time Job looked at this baby girl, he was reminded that it was the Lord. I'm done now. Who knows how to give him beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I got to go. But even against the backdrop of unspeakable pain, God restores Job in such a way that Job, even after the pain that he went through, chose to live again. And maybe that's what God is calling me to tell you on this Sunday morning. It's time for you to live again, to forgive again to give again to grow again because there is more to life than the pain that you're experiencing and if you remain faithful to him God will show you favor I hear the psalmist declaring that those who sow in tears will reap in joy those who go out weeping carrying seeds to sow will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with them everybody stand to your feet all over the church we're going home My brothers and my sisters, listen to me and listen to me well. I don't, I don't want you to miss the significance and the simplicity of what, I'm, what, what the Lord said to us today. God is turning some things around. I know I didn't present it in the typical Vicente fashion, but I think the point was well eloqu uh, 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 executed, right? The, the point was explained. The point was explained. The point was explained. And so I need somebody to receive this by faith because I think that's really the, the point and premise. I think that's why the Lord didn't let me communicate it the way I typically would because I don't want it, he didn't want it to get lost. This is a faith statement because what you see right now is a bunch of hurt. What you see right now is a bunch of pain. What you see right now is a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of anxiety about the future and a whole lot of, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And while all of that very well may be true, we've got a God, listen to what I'm saying to you, who specializes. That's what he does in turning things around. And so if you're here this weekend and you need to experience the turnaround, can I tell you the greatest, most significant thing that God could ever do for you is turn you from a sinner into a saint. And so if you're here this weekend, you're on site, you're watching online, and you have yet to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, why don't you take a step of faith? And take your first step in faith and watch God take the second step in faithfulness toward you. If you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you want to know more about this Christ, we'd love to talk to you. If you're on site, you can join us in the room to my left and to your right. That's room 145. We've got spiritual decision team members who are headed there now. 
right out this door, right here where that camera is. If you're on site, you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or maybe you want to join this church. You want to be a part of a community of faith that believes in the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit and believes in the power of God to do in an instant what needs to be done, but also is wise enough to know that while God can do it in an instant boogie, he does his best work usually in increments. And we want to walk with you through the increments. If you want to be a part of a church like this, we'd love to be your brothers and sisters in the faith. Our pastor would absolutely love to be your lead pastor. If you want to say yes to our church, say yes to Christ. Maybe you need somebody to partner with you in prayer. But you want to do that, again, on site, room 145 to my left and your right. And if you want to make those decisions and you're watching online, you too can do the exact same thing. All you got to do is dial the number on the screen, 877 632 Aren't you glad you came to church today?